Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Art of Transformation podcast. I'm your host, Mark Sheff. And today I talked with Celia Alario. This was an awesome conversation. We, we kind of had to cut it off at some point because there was so much there. She's a coach now, but she has decades of experience in uh, doing PR and marketing for social impact, climate justice, you know, uh, justice in, in various arenas. Um, I'm going to read what she wrote for me. She said she's a transformational coach supporting clients and experience greater vitality, joy, and authentic expression. She helps social impact change agents and do-gooders maintain balance and optimal well-being, even while speaking truth to power. And we get into this in the podcast, and I'll just say, you know, when we're doing this work in the world, something that she says she's recovering from is activist burnout. So she's very familiar with what it is that, that these people are going through. So I'll leave it there, and I'll let you listen to the episode, and I will see you on the other side. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Art of Transformation podcast. I'm your host, Mark Sheff, and I am here today with Celia Alario. Celia, welcome to the to the show. It's great to have you. Oh, it's so fun to be with you. Yeah, we had a great uh, conversation last time. Our prep conversation, I think it's supposed to be 20 minutes. It ended up being an hour because we had so much to talk about. <laughs> yeah. Um, where are you? Tell us, tell us where you are uh, now in the world. Uh, I'm based in Moab, Utah, which is southeastern Utah, and it's a a small little purple county in uh, an otherwise red state. And it's an unusual spot because it's it's exquisite, really arresting beauty, big wilderness, lots of national parks. This is where Arches and Canyonlands National Park are. But uh, it's also something that is very international and vibrant because mm. we get about 3 million visitors a year coming through. And we're a permanent town of probably about 7,000 residents. And this is where I escaped L.A. to live. <laughs> yeah. One of the things that really fast, I know you do some different work now, but you have a background in uh, media. And I, I forget if you did if you did PR, but working with I mean, you tell us, but I was fascinated by your real commitment to social change, environmental change. Uh, you have some really great language about that on your on your website and in the work you do. But tell us a little bit about kind of where you were before you transformed into into what you're doing now. Yeah. Well, you're right. I did a lot of social justice, climate and environmental justice communications. And so that meant training spokespeople, doing PR, marketing, eventually social mm. media for social change. And, you know, it was wonderful. Uh, I got to work with amazing folks. And I still do work with a lot of those those types of folks. But, you know, it was across the gamut. The main work I did was really in radical social change movement se uh, sectors, but I also worked with authors, filmmakers, creatives mm. of different types. Um, but it took a toll on me, you know, mm. and I experienced all sorts of health challenges, which now looking back, I realize are people refer to things as, oh, it's activist burnout or an autoimmune condition or these various things. But a lot of it was really just being emotionally unregulated and taking on what it took to be on those front lines, uh, working mm. for peace, working working really at places where the rubber meets the road, you know, the points of destruction, the points of injustice, and intervening and being present to amazing people who had things to say that were important, often people who were disproportionately left out of conversations. And that those mm. were the people I was striving to get onto television news and, and get into print and you know, but but I didn't do it in a balanced way. So mm. that price that I paid for that is what inspired me then to to become a, a health and wellness coach and to start to blend these things together. It sounds like you do a lot of that work for people who are in various ongoing <laughs> fights for for justice, for peace, for for climate change. You know, it's funny, my 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 wife is in that world a lot. So I, I spend some time there. And my understanding is that especially in talk about any of these, you know, any of these missions, any of these movements, whether it's racial justice, climate justice. You know the work, the work is ongoing, unfortunately, and yet the people who are in it, like we're humans, we we can't just kind of be in this like endless summer of 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 effort. And yet there's always, you know, there's always something, there's always something to do. There's always something. There's always some new initiative. There's always a a, a new issue or a new bill or a new something to work on. So what I'm curious, moving into the transition a little bit, right? What was missing for you that you saw as now essential to, to bring to the people who are doing this kind of work? 
Yeah, this is such a great question. And it's, and it's definitely something I'm still discovering about myself and with my clients. But I think some of it is boundaries and edges. And a lot of times we uh, work to our own edge, which might be physical exhaustion, <laughs> as opposed to uh, some type of math that has us working to a certain point and then stopping and taking space. And I see that math play out in a couple of different ways. Some of it is, is it literally in our work planning. You know, people don't schedule time to be creative, time to mm. rest, time to play. It, people don't also schedule time for uh, spontaneous opportunities that happen. And this is something I think some of the best entrepreneurs in business do is they recognize that if they have 10 or 15% of their time that is unscheduled, that's not wasteful. It's actually right. opportunistic and it's, right. it's, it's allowing for what happens when you're in the flow and something magical occurs, right? And then you can actually take full advantage of that and, and really just, you know, suck all the nectar out of the moment and the opportunity. The other thing I think that happens is, again, it's, a, you know, if you work until you can't go anymore, that might work in your 20s <laughs> or that <laughs> might work if you have the privilege of a certain type of constitution. But for most of us, you're eventually going to hit a point where physically, emotionally, spiritually, you run out of steam. And oftentimes the recovery from that is a little more intense than we thought yeah. that it would be. Yeah. It, I mean, in a very, like a very simple example is, and this started to happen to me in my, you know, in my, in my late thirties, you know, I have a lot of different creative projects going on. Lots of you know, we're working towards, you know, building a life, a family, a business. And, mm -hmm. you know, it would be 11 o'clock and I'd be like, oh, I, you know, I have this, this thing I want to build online or this painting I want to make or, you know, something, you know, whatever. And the thing that really helped me, and I, I talked to my wife about this a lot is, okay, I could stay up for three hours doing this, go to bed at two in the morning and having, you know, have it done. Or I could go to bed now and get it done in 30 minutes tomorrow. <laughs> You know, and also be rested and also not lose the entire day or be kind of zoned out or, you know, or whatever. I like what you said. I want to go back to something you said. I actually literally this morning was, was meeting with a client and this, this was the topic of conversation because we're so, um, when we're committed to change in the world, we get excited by the possibilities. We get, we get excited by the things and there's lots of things that we can do. So. You know, our calendars fill up. We start to reach this capacity. And we, we had the same discovery this morning in, in the meeting is that there's, you know, there's that, I like what you said, that unscheduled time. You know, that time, what, uh, I, I forget where, where I heard this, but it's all over the place now, to, to sort of let your brain go into default mode, to, to be bored in a way. Because there's a great TED Talk on being bored in which he talks yeah. about the default mode where you know, you're not solving a problem. You're not focused on a thing. You're not, you know, maybe you're, maybe you're out on a walk or in the shower, like all these places where you're not, you really aren't doing anything else. That's where your right brain. And this is like, this is, you know, neuroscience. This is, this is actually what happens is your right brain starts to sort of mush these ideas that aren't connected together. And that's when you come up with new ideas or better ideas. So the thing that we discovered this morning that was so fascinating was, you know, that, that the client this morning, there were things that she could do that would make her feel good that she was going to say no to in service of her health, her wellness and, and, and her greater work, like the greater impact of the work. Yes. yes. Where, I'm curious where you've, where you've seen this in action. Yeah. Well, and this comes up a lot in a bunch of different realms of, you know, the people that I'm working with now the main focus of our coaching is around communications and where communications and well-being and leadership intersect. So in the little sweet spot of that Venn diagram is where I'm playing with my clients. And yeah. this comes up a lot of different ways. But one of the things that I was thinking about was, you know, people somehow think that they can be like creative on demand. And, uh -huh. you know, it's one thing to sit down and do data entry on demand, you know, or to sure. do something like copy edit, something where there's a certain kind of, of way that your brain is working and there's a right way and a wrong way to do it. In the end, you either spelled the word right or you didn't. You did the math right or you didn't. That's right. not how creativity and also even how uh, some finding of our inner authenticity and agency happens. I don't think you can just say, okay, I'm going to be authentic and, and build up my bravery right 
now, start the clock, you know, and do it and then quickly transition into a Zoom meeting. And so the flexibility, I think, is, is really important. The other thing that happens that's interesting is that we have to, we, you were saying we were, we're animals, right? So part of what happens to us, in, and this is a survival mechanism, it's something to celebrate, is that in times of crisis, in times of trauma, in times of scarcity, and whether that scarcity is how many hours I have to paint my painting or how many minutes I'm going to get on CNN, that act, those moments of crisis and challenge shut down the communication center of our brain. And that's cool. If I'm running from a saber-toothed tiger that wants to have me for lunch, I don't need to write a sonnet. I need to run like heck. And my brain is going to free that up. And so for all of us, you know, we can dip into and celebrate the lineage, you know, of our of our animal bodies that have made it so that we could be here safely to then have the the privilege of a challenge about what the heck is going on with my calendly. And how am I going to do my creative work? But, you know, to just understand our humanity, I think, is really important. And to recognize that any perceived threat, any perceived trauma, any perceived scarcity is going to work counter to someone's ability to communicate. And I I saw this for years, training spokespeople. I had no idea what was happening. I just watched really smart people who were great in practice shut down as soon as we were on live radio. And we didn't, you know, really understand exactly what was happening. Now I understand the brain science behind it because it was part of what I learned in the health coaching certification program that I went through. And I feel really blessed now to have some science behind the, you know, thousands of people that I had watched with this phenomenon. And so part of what you're literally doing is is cross training. You know, if you if you want to be awesome in a certain part of your work, the cross training. Mm is your care, is your leisure, is your rest, is your pleasure and your joy. And so it's almost non-negotiable. And in the same way, elite athletes realize they need to stretch and hydrate and cross-train. We have to cross-train with aspects that, you know, according to some ways of looking at work might seem like goofing off or it might seem, seem unproductive. Un- unproductive, right? Like I'm not producing the thing I'm producing. I'm not I'm not dealing with the issue that's right in front of me, but like, you know, I I kind of what I was saying before, you know, sleep is like kind of a, a a keystone, like cross train. One of my, uh, Tamsin, who was on the, on the podcast before talked about that as a, as a keystone habit, um, as a habit that kind of unlocks potential in maybe the other things that feel more, that feel more productive. Um, I love that idea of cross training. And you also said something that I want to, I just want to see if there's something there because it's so interesting. There's this idea of, of scarcity, scarcity of time, scarcity of effort. You know, when we're, what I've seen, you know, is that it's like, it's almost like the curse of the, of the creative mind is that we can see these big imaginative visions, these big pictures, you know, in the work that you're doing, I imagine people can really and have spent time codifying and, and, and writing down what is our vision for the planet, for justice, for the world? What do we want it to look like? And, you know, we're also aware that we're humans, so we only have so much time, so we better hurry up. What, mm-hmm. would, you, what would you say in response to someone with, you know, with, with that kind of urgency and that kind of thinking? Mm-hmm. Well, so I think urgency is an addiction, and I don't know if it's as addictive as sugar uh, which is, you know, probably up there in the top five things, you know, uh, but it's, at, it's, it's right, it's right there. It's close. You know, the idea, there's a quote and I wish I can remember who said it right now, but it was like something, everything's happening so fast or everything is so urgent, which is why we must go slowly. You know, mm. I don't know where that comes from, but it's a, you know, some proverb that I heard that really resonated for me. And I think that the, the, um, the reality is that that experience just activates our our nervous system and it doesn't mm. it doesn't usually serve us again if there's a crisis if you're a first responder and you're in the wilderness it's great that you have you know right. that ability to activate because yeah. things are urgent if a and, lion is chasing you run <laughs> right and i don't want to downplay the existential threats of our time because people who are looking around and feeling a sense of urgency are not wrong like there are a lot of things happening uh, time-bound things that are happening, challenges that we and injustices that we face, challenges for for threats to the planet. So the the that is 
the it's not that you're illogical or irrational. It's that the response doesn't always serve you. And so the emotional regulation work, the breath work, the pleasure and joy work that are or offerings that we give to ourselves, rest, uh, mm. those things actually, you know, truly matter. And they are the fitness work. They are the preparation that that helps us. And so what I'll always say to a client is you could do another run through of the presentation or you could go have a walk with your dog, go be with your beloveds, get in the bath, you know, and I will always vote for those other things because I think that those are the things that are preparing us on a level that we don't always think about. A lot of people focus so much on preparing their content. And when I work with clients, I think about content, of course, but also st their, their style of presentation and then mindset or heart set, you know, intention, that mm. aspect of it. And to, to me, those are, they deserve, you know, higher billing than they get. You know, everyone says mm. content is king and people are going to re rework their talk 17 times, but they don't always think about what are the values I'm conveying? What is the larger vision? Why am I even talking in the first place? You know, what's motivating? What's the big why? And those are these huge, like untapped wellsprings of power and strength and energy that when you consider them as much as you consider, you know, what's on slide four of your deck, you get results that are irresistible to the people you're presenting and talking with. And I think that we just, we lose sight of that, you know, and a lot of that is, is, uh, you know, a response to, to things that are happening in society that, that teach us that what we say might matter more than how we say it. But there's, you know, there's that great Maya Angelou quote, you know, people might not remember what you said or what you did, but they'll remember how you made them feel, mm. you know, and, yeah, and that's, I, I, that's, wonderful. that's what we're after, you know? So mm. I, I try to, con, you know, I work with clients a lot on vibe as much as we work on content, you know? Yeah. I think we can all, I mean, I can, I can think of many talks, you know, that I've, that I've seen and, yeah, the ones that stand out, certainly there's tons of interesting content out there, but the ones that really stand out are the people who have, who just feel grounded and present. And speaking just purely, you know, sort of tactically, you know, as someone who is occasionally in front of people, you know, I can imagine one of the fears, of course, is I've got to have the content down. I've got to have the, the pre you know, I've got to make sure everything's perfect. And what I hear you saying is, you do this very, very important foundational work, A, to create a whole person instead of this sort of content robot so that it comes off better. But also I imagine, and a little bit from experience, if I'm clear on my values, if, I, if I'm clear on, you know, the purpose and I'm, you know, and I'm rested and, you know, I've taken care of myself. If and or when things do go wrong, the recording pauses, the slides go wrong, I have a foundation of clarity of what's important in my work, in my life. And so I'm not going to get thrown off of that. And so it's okay if things, you know, things don't go right. I probably talk about this more than almost anything, but, you know, I love practicing jujitsu. And, and as you progress mm -hmm. in, in the practice, it's not that I feel, you know, infinitely confident going into, you know, into training or into these matches. But in a way I, I do, I know that I'm there to learn. I know that I'm there to progress. I know that, I'm, you know, in some, you know, now that I'm a, sl a slightly upper level belt, I'm there to even teach a little bit. And if things, things go wrong all the time, you know, I, I get tapped by some new guy or, you know, or, or, you know, think, you know, things didn't quite go the way I wanted in the role. And, and that's okay. Cause that's, that outcome is not my goal. My mm -hmm. goal is, my goal is to show up. My goal is to live my values. And, and I'm drawing that comparison because, I, because A, I compare jujitsu to everything. And also, <laughs> I see that as very much almost like what you, like you said. I think you even used the word, like you're training. You're tra you, the people are, people mm -hmm. are in training and rest and restoration is a part of that training. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. In, in the work that you do, what is the impact that you hope to see in the world? Well, What's exciting about the work that I do in terms of impact is that we're looking at the impacts that happen in the individuals. And part of the reason why I left the whole soup to nuts of public relations and media and all of that work that I was doing, well, there were a couple of reasons, you know, but, but I could have stayed pitching reporters, uh, doing larger level marketing and strategy. 
But what I saw was I started to look back over, you know, I had a big birthday a number of years ago and I looked back and, and thought about legacy. And part of what I recognized was that a lot of the issues that I work on flip flop back and forth depending on how election seasons go. I'll work or, you know, or who owns an entity. You know, we work on something, we protect a wild area uh, that then the, the company that owns that sells it to a military or, you know, a military hunt that takes it over. They do a partnership or they sell it to somebody else. And so the work that I was doing felt like a little bit being, being a zombie warrior. You know, we would, mm. we would temporarily make gains in these areas for justice or protect these places. And, but it was never done. The work was never permanently done. The work that was, however, permanently impactful that could not be changed by who won the next election was the individual transformations that happen inside the spokespeople that I was training. When people tap in to that purpose that you're talking about, purpose as a noun and a verb, you know, right? You're being on purpose, you know, it's, mm -hmm. a, it's an action in and of itself. When they tap into their values and their big why and they find their authentic voice, they get over what they, whatever they've made up, whatever old story or old agreements are, are keeping right. them small or keeping them quiet. And they find that authentic voice. They're speaking truth to power. They're doing it in a way that feels really good to them and that their audience is find irresistible, right? Those things could not be changed by, you know, 51% voting for council person so-and-so or uh, president-elect so-and-so. It doesn't matter, right? So that was what the shift was for mm -hmm. me, was if I could make the biggest impact in the world, it was going to be in walking alongside these folks who really have important things to say, whose perspectives are, you know, exquisitely vital in these times, supporting mm -hmm. them in in being able to hone their voice, in creating, you know, as we do as coaches, new stories, little experiments, you know, um, mm. changes in agreements that we might play with to try to notice and transform whatever's holding holding back the the transformation that folks want. And mm. so that's, you know, that was the big the big reason for me that this made more sense than anything else because those are the kinds of things that I could actually count, you know, acres of forest saved, how many whales protected, um, you know, how, how many people were spared in a, in a, in a war or a genocide. Those were numbers that I couldn't really count over time and say, this has been my life in activism, unfortunately. So, mm -hmm. but those, those individual shifts, those matter and they're, and they're irreversible. Yeah. I, I like you said, it's, it's hard to, <laughs> it's hard to walk when when you connect with something like that it's sort of it's sort of hard to walk back and and something you said which i just want to highlight too is that some of the work and some of the decisions around how to do the work become easier when you're you know when you have connected to and for me like part of you know part of my deeper you know i i have a, a purpose statement but you know part of it it's not just like okay that's my work but it's also my kids my family how i show up for myself so so it makes it one, one, I have a little workshop that I run with people. And, and one of the things that inevitably happens is that there's some decision that they're struggling with, but when they really have a, have the words or the name or the three values or whatever it is, it's easier to say, well, let's look at these decisions through that lens. I'm really connected mm -hmm. to this now. Okay. So, you know, this decision that felt hard before, what would the person who is living this purpose say in this moment. I, I really love uh, actually James Clear, you know, Atomic Habits. I, I love mm -hmm. what he says about identity-based habits. It's almost the same thing where you're like, okay, once I've really decided the kind of person that I'm going to be in you mm -hmm. know, my legacy and my future, mm -hmm. I'll just ask them, what, do you, what would you do in this situation? And they're going to say, oh, well, the thing you're thinking about doesn't even matter. You should just go, you know, you should go do this. Oh, you're like, oh, it's easy now. Mm -hmm. have, you, have you seen that also in your work? Oh, absolutely. And I think that this is part of what we're talking about is, is that we live in a culture, um, and this is white supremacy at work. This is capitalism at work, but, uh, patriarchy at work. But we, you know, we live in a culture that holds up the doing over the being and what we're relearning together and, and, and helping our clients to understand is that our beingness matters. And so what do you, what do I mean by that? You know, a state of being, it's how you think and, um, and how you feel. It's your overall well-being versus, you know, your health might be a state of the body, but your well-being and the well-being of the planet and your community 
is, is that, that state of being. And so when we allow ourselves to recognize that the, there's more than the big lie that all there is, is the doing and that the measuring of our success, the metrics should be all around the doing, the outputs and the outcomes, you know, versus, versus the larger. Then there's freedom suddenly to reimagine what success looks like. And it's not just the results that you walked into a meeting trying to get or that you are working on on a political campaign. It's that beingness. And I talk about this a lot with clients that if you can stay true to what you set out as a goal for your beingness, the way you wanted to behave, your ground of being in the matter, you know, if you can stay true to that, then there's a win there for you. And this was first articulated to me. I have to give some love and props for the um, Social Entrepreneurs Academy that I was a part of. The tagline is stay true, get paid, do good. And the, <laughs> and the master coach that I worked with, it was fantastic, you know, and this was part of the teaching that, that she offered to me that really, you know, transformed my life and transformed the way that, that I ended up serving my clients. It's an organization called Move the Crowd, and we'll give some love for mm -hmm. them. Uh, I was involved with them at the very beginning a long time ago. And Ra, who was the woman who was my coach, you know, really first was the first person that helped me to, to create that distinction. But it's a big part a big part of the liberation that's available in coaching. I love that. I, I, can you say the, um, can you say the, uh, the, the phrase again that, the, that they had? Yeah. Stay true, get, uh, stay true, get paid, do good. I love that. Um, it, it reminds me a little bit of the, um, the sort of ikigai philosophy, right? The, mm -hmm. um, the that sweet spot of, I object and, and, and reject this. Just do what you love and it'll all work out. You know, no, it's, it's, you know, do find, find something that you love doing and that you're good at and that you can get paid for. Right. But also, and the world needs, mm -hmm. if you can find that, if you can find that, that sweet spot. And I think yeah. what, what's, I, I don't, I don't, I don't know. I have not studied the philosophy in any really deep way. So maybe this is, this is in there, but I hear you kind of adding this level of, you know, and at the same time, do this in all the areas of your life. If you mm -hmm. sort of examine your, your life through that lens or your being through that lens, what you, what you said really landed for me, you know, that, that we had, we put this doing above being. And, and it's, I, I hope it's obvious to the people who are listening, but you know, if it's not, that's just this idea that like things have to be productive. Meeting with this person this, this morning saying, well, I've got this time during the day and somebody needs it. So I, and I can do it. So I will do it. And I'm like, well, you don't maybe have that time during that day because maybe that time is actually reserved for your rest, for your restoration, because you yeah. know, you're at capacity, your your output, 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 output. At the end of the day, you don't have any you don't have any down cycles. You know, my background's in computers, and and actually, it's kind of funny. Like we used to joke about. It. I used to in college, I was a computer assistant. You know, and people would call, we'd go to their <laughs> rooms and try to figure out what was wrong with their computer, and. Many, 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 many of the times was turn it off, let it rest for about 30 minutes and then turn it back on. And, and even with these, you know, complex, just data purpose, you know, these productive doing machines, like they need to rest. Like, yeah, like it's not just humans. Like we all, we all need a minute to just like restore our battery and to come back and to come back fresh and we'll do better work. You know, we'll do mm -hmm. better work for that. Absolutely. Um, well, yeah. I just want to toss into the mix, you know, the client that I was with coaching before I came to you today, we were, this is, you know, so on point with what was happening. And the experiment that we created together was to take the approach to the places where he is putting into his schedule, things like his workout, his writing time, his mm -hmm, time mm -hmm. offline, hanging out with friends, what have you and apply the same principle that he would to somebody who was really important, somebody who, unless it was a major emergency, he would never cancel on that person. Because what had happened was he was putting things into his schedule, but wherever he needed to push and make accommodations for others, he would cancel on himself. He was out of integrity, out of agreement with himself mm -hmm. on such a regular basis that he felt like he was that having a lived experience, a, that he wasn't trustworthy. That is such a important thing you just said 
out of integrity and out of agreements with yourself. And I feel like this is something that especially highly successful people, especially people who are in organizational movement work, it will happen because we yeah. have these agreements. I'm going to go, I'm going to go work out. I'm going to, I'm going to go outside. I'm going to do this thing. And then those things get pushed aside for the work, for the doing. That's a, I think, I just feel like that's such a beautiful way of putting that. Yeah. Well, and, and again, it's like for some people, it's hard to do that leveling up to, to being in that way with themselves. So the thought experiment, the, the game becomes, think of somebody who you would never cancel on unless it was really urgent. When you book this for yourself with you, imagine, and for the next week until I see you again and we, and we coach again, treat that meeting as if it's a meeting with that other person. If, there's, if you can't pull it off and you still cancel, notice the dialogue. What was the argument that got you to just give that time up over and over for yourself, because that's a good data point. Bring that back. Let's coach around that inner conversation. But, you know, that's, that's part of what I think some of this, some of the work ends up, up being. And, and I understand that those of us who are in service, this is our growing edge. And I, you know, I, I want to say this, all the things I'm saying, you know, need to be prefaced with mad love and respect for people, whether it's moms, parents, you know, whether it's teachers, whether it's caregivers, whether it's people who do social justice, transformational work, politicians, civil servants. I have the deepest respect for people for whom this is a problem. And I will say like any bad habit left unchecked, the ramifications of this on your wellness, not just the wellness of of you in the workplace and your your livelihood and your community, but your inner wellness, your inner relationship to self will suffer. And so really noticing these things and being vigilant about interventions to address them are mm. essential. And I also just, yeah, I'm just tipping my hat because I've been there. I know how hard that is. I think it's something that it's just habitual in those of us who imagine ourselves to be in service to a greater unfolding. So. Yeah. That's, I mean, that's, that's a beautiful way to, to sort of bring this to a close. But uh, as, a, as a final thought, you know, if there is somebody out there who's listening who maybe kind of went, oh, shoot, maybe that is me. But it feels hard. It feels hard to get off that, to get off that, you know, you, you, you've set a momentum, you've set a pace, you've committed to this schedule, you've, you've maybe overcommitted or you're at capacity. And it can feel, you know, it, I think I think for a lot of people it can also sort of feel like it's a it's a sort of vicious cycle like you've you've are, you, once you sort of see that that maybe there's a better way of doing things you start to maybe judge yourself for not having done that for so long and especially you know being sort of middle aged I think I see this a lot where people are like uh, you know there's a there's sort of a negative feeling that keeps them stuck because now, you know, we're, we're older and we're, we're learning about this stuff and we go, oh, shoot, I should have been doing this for the last 30 years. And it feels too late. You know, it feels like, well, I'm just going to, I'm just going to push through. I'm, you know, it's 11 o'clock. I'm just going to go through till two because I've already kind of screwed up. Like, what would you say to somebody who's listening and maybe has heard a little bit of something for themselves in, in, in what you've said? Mm. Well, I think that there's something here about authority. Uh, our own inner authority and the things hmm. that are the have tos versus the get tos or the want tos. And so for me, like the, I think that there's a, an inventory to be done. And I would start with people tracking your time is actually a really good thing. And just being able to understand like how long does stuff actually take, particularly for me as someone who, you know, is a solopreneur and somebody who, you know, is, is, um, uh, oftentimes a consultant, you know, it's, it's important to just have a sense of how long things take and how much time we really want for things. But I think that I would direct people toward a tool that I really love, um, that I've been working with for, for many years with clients called the heart's desire matrix. And I, you know, it's, it's this tool where you get to look at the tasks and make a determination on a scale, you know, where one axis is, I love it. And the other is I'm good at it. Um, and to to start to look at what are the things that I really love and I'm really good at? What are the things that like I think I want to get better at and I think I might love, but I'm not sure, but I want to know for sure. And how do you start to have time and even move your tasks and professional responsibilities squarely over into that side of this, you know, 
um, ax of this of this x y axis and imagine if you've mm. got the four quadrants you want to stay the heck away from neither am i good at it nor do i love, love it. it not good at it yeah what are you doing <laughs> or the most dangerous quadrant for me in the transformation that i've been making because people knew me as somebody who they could get to pitch their stories and and do their media work is the i'm good at it but i don't really love it mm -hmm. anymore or maybe i never did you know and the freedom that comes just from inventorying what am I, what's on my calendar and what isn't making it onto my calendar? And how do I feel about all of this? And then we get to do the really fun inner work with people as coaches of helping them get over whatever old beliefs or authority issues, you know, they've, they've brought on themselves that have them actually thinking that they have to do a bunch of stuff that isn't their heart's desire. Mm -hmm. um, and where did that idea come from? I think it's, um, Khalil Gibran, who wrote The Prophet, I'm pretty sure he's the person who said work is love made visible. Mm, mm. And if that's true, like you said a lot of things earlier, I want to go back and re-listen to this, all the different things where you said, where you talked about work. And what if, what if everything you were just saying about work was, you know, now reimagined through this, this premise that we just, if we decide to take on what he's saying that work is love made visible, then suddenly the way we think about all the stuff we're doing uh, could be different. And I think, again, I could, you know, I'm the first one who could line up with a litany of, you know, systems in crises on planet Earth and challenges that we all face, the existential crises of our time. And all of that, to me, would be even more evidence that we have to live our heart's desire, more evidence that thinking about work as love made visible is the way that we're going to actually feel the most rested, make the best decisions and level up in the ways that we want to. It's just a, it's almost like those are the lenses and we put those glasses on first and imagine. And, and so then you've got to talk yourself into the idea that that's part of what is possible in, in your human condition. And if you get there and then you see the world through those lens, those lenses, then what happens? about what happens to your calendar, <laughs> what mm. happens to your task list. No. Yeah. I, I mean, God, there's, there's so much there. I want with the, I think what the thing that I'm kind of taking away, and I don't know if you said this exactly. So tell me, tell me if this, <laughs> tell me if this is like, not at all what you're saying, but I, I love the, what did you call it? The hearts, the hearts matrix? Hearts desire matrix. Hearts, yeah. Hearts desire matrix. Yeah. That's, that's, I, I, I love that concept. Um, it reminds me of some other things, but it's totally its own thing, which I love about it. Um, and I haven't heard of it, but, um, this idea that of course you want to be in the quadrant of like things you love and, th you know, things that you're good at, you know, it's sort of dangerous to sort of stay in this, you know, and, and I think people, especially sort of in midlife, like now we're kind of good at things and people want us to do them, but we might be ready to, to move on. And that's when, you know, that's when we start to, but we maybe, maybe that was in the upper quadrant before, but now it's not. And so that's, that's where I think coaches like you really come in to really reflect back and say, maybe you've grown, maybe you're not there anymore and you need these other things. But one of the things that I think I'm hearing in here that's interesting too, um, is that, you know, if you're talking about your matrix, you know, you, and you even said like, maybe there's something that, you know, you, you want to sort of try out and see if you can get better at it, see if it moves up in this direction. And and similarly, and this sort of reminds me of um, Terry Trespicio's work, who, who wrote the Passion Trap. Uh, mm -hmm. I'm, actually, I'm I'm hoping that's the name of her book. Um, that's the name of her TED talk, anyway. But uh, just this idea that you know you could also have something, you know, th there might also be something that that you are you good at or capable of doing that maybe you could also find a way to love. Not that you have to just keep going at it hard, but there's maybe a mindset shift or a way of looking at it. I see this with artists all the time, you know, where they, they just want to paint. They don't want to do their day jobs. I had an artist that I was working with really just shift her mindset about the intention and purpose of the work that she was doing. She works, you know, she does marketing and sort of design work and was like, ah, I feel like I, don't, I shouldn't be doing this. But when she shifted her mindset that this was serving her art, this was serving her creativity, this was serving her deeper purpose, it became much easier. You know, suddenly, suddenly it's not, you know, mm. it's not that. Yeah. Like, this is my life's work. I love in, in, in this way, but there's a way that she integrated it with these, uh, like you're talking, I mean, what we're talking about so much is, is really just sort of integrating the whole person so that they can live their purpose. And yes. I think we can acknowledge that not everyone has the privilege to, 
just go and, you know, do what they love forever. They may have to, you know, pay bills or do work or pick up their kids or, you know, whatever it is. And we can find these small ways of uh, relensing, almost like what you were mm -hmm. saying, like looking through a different lens to uh, to create a different connection to both work and play, right? Yes, yes. And so the two two lenses maybe to leave people with, and uh, one is one that I needed for a lot of years for that I'm good at it, but I don't love it anymore. Part of the <laughs> arts desire matrix yeah. was just because I can doesn't mean I have to, and that became a mantra for a while. I, but then the other, the, the other, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, and one more is the fierce inquiry of love. Like, is there love here? Can there be love here? And what is here that's unlike love? And if I banish what is unlike love, is there something here still? And so a fierce inquiry about love and then the just because I can doesn't mean I have to. And for me, that that combo platter was very helpful in making a pretty significant life shift, which... um you know, even though it's all over my LinkedIn, I still get calls all the time. And I love the idea of, you know, I hope I hope someone gets a lot of media for the campaign they're calling me about. I love what they're doing, but I am not going to do that work, you know, and I refer out, you know, a lesser percentage than I used to. But where I'm going to is going to be to a time that when it's clear enough to to me and enough, to, you know, I've, I've said it enough from the shouted it from the mountaintops enough that when people call, they're calling me for exactly the, the work that I want to be doing, mm -hmm. not the work mm -hmm. they use that I used to do. Mm -hmm. you know? God, I, th yeah. I think I have to have you back to have just a whole episode on that concept. That, you know, <laughs> when you're going through transition, that's, that's one of the hardest things, right? Is people are still used to you as you were and, and getting to that place where people now see you the way that you see, because you knew where you were going or you know where you're going, but it takes, it takes people out. I want to stop things here so that we don't have like a four hour episode. I, I, I do want to have you back. So we'll talk about that after. <laughs> but in the meantime, yeah. if people got some inspiration, if people are excited to work on some of this stuff with you, where can they find you? Well, it's really easy. Go to my website, which is my name, CeliaAlario.com. And if you scroll to the bottom and uh, are interested in that heart's desire matrix, you can share your email and I'll send you that. And that's one way to, to just dive in to continue this inquiry. Uh, and yeah, there's there's both one on one coaching uh, for health, one on one coaching for communication, and then a cohort academy that you can learn about there if you want to play with me and some other folks uh, at this intersection that I was talking about. And thanks so much, Mark, for this time and also for the folks that you've been bringing to our lives through the podcast. It's a it's just a great array of people that you're introducing us to, and it's it's been great to to be listening and have you have you in my earbuds when I'm out on the trails. Oh, I so appreciate that. I mean, and I'm so grateful for you being here. I'm a huge fan of the work you do in the world. I think it's so important, um, not just the work that you do, but also the kinds of people that you're doing it with. We're, you know, like you said, we're, we're in, we have multiple existential crises going on in the world right now. And sometimes the work we just have to do is getting back to being human. And I see that you're doing that out in the world. And um, thank you so much for your time and for your wisdom today. Oh, thanks. This has been a pleasure. Thanks for listening to the episode. I don't script these, so I'm going a little bit off the cuff, but I do want to make sure that I thank a few people, including Podetize, who does our video editing and our audio editing and make sure that these podcasts get out on time. You would not be listening to this if it weren't for them. And so I want to acknowledge and appreciate them. And also Squared Away, uh, which is my virtual assistant who helps me schedule all these things and get all these people on. So I would just want to acknowledge the people who really the, the team that helps make these possible. Thank you again for listening. And also thank you for making this possible. When you listen to the podcast, when you share it with your friends, when you like it, when you subscribe, when you do all those things, it really does make a difference. It helps us uh, at least keep going. It helps our emotional well-being. Um, so thank you again. Uh, keep doing what you're doing. And I will see you next time.